Well, good afternoon. Thank you again to General Dynamics for supporting today's meal, and thank you for being here, all of you, with us this week in San Diego. It's now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, the Honorable Thomas B. Modley, Undersecretary of the Navy, a 1983 Naval Academy graduate. He served in the U.S. Navy as a UH-1 November pilot, and after leaving active duty in 1990, he attained a Harvard MBA. Mr. Mobley was most recently the managing director in PricewaterhouseCoopers National Security Practice and the Global Government Defense Network leader for the firm which he joined in 2007. He previously served as the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Financial Management from 2004 to 2007. In the 10 years prior to that, he served with distinction in several corporate roles. We're lucky to have Secretary Modley serving our nation once again as the 33rd Undersecretary of the Navy. Let's give a warm welcome to Mr. Tom Modley. All right, I get the pleasure of another post-lunch talk in front of thousands of people. That's great, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Last time I spoke in front of a crowd this big at luncheon, I was kind of sitting in the same seat that I was sitting in today, but on the thing, okay, now that is very disconcerting, having to see that back there, but when I was sitting during the lunch, they had my official photo up there, and so I was eating lunch like staring at a 40-foot picture of my face the whole time. And when I got up on stage, I realized that I was wearing the exact same coat and tie combination as the official picture. So I'm, I'm doing the same today. <laughs> so not on purpose. Uh, but thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, I really do uh, value and treasure the opportunity to get out and talk to folks in industry and also to have the opportunity to share in the congratulations uh, for uh, our sailors and Marines who are who are out there doing the really hard work for us every day. So I want to give another round of applause for all those that were recognized today. So I always used to ask my kids, uh, when they got home from school, I would say, you know, what'd you learn today? And for those of you who have children, you probably all know what the answer is to that, right? What is it? Nothing, right? So I try to get them to think a little bit more creatively and come up with you know, the one or two things that they learned. And so, uh, and it's a good discipline to get into, even um, at our old age, uh, to think about you know, what's, what's the big thing you learned that day, what's that key thing, that, that key item that you can keep in your mind and think about. So I've been in, the job for about, I've been in this job for about 14 or 15 months. And so th what I thought I would do today is just talk to you a little bit about some of those key things that I've been thinking about over the last year, things that have come up. And largely many of these things are things that I wasn't really thinking about before I got into the job, or at least before I got nominated uh, for, for the position. So I thought I would share those with you. Um, so if you can cue up the, uh... okay, there's the first thing. Uh, not enough ships. Uh, one of the big challenges we, all, we have in the Navy right now is uh, no decrease in operational requirements. Uh, and yet not enough ships to do the mission. Uh, we've seen some of the ramifications of that with uh, fatigued crews and um, unfortunately it manifested itself in some tragedies for us in the last couple years. And so big problem for us. We're looking at uh, what that future force structure might look like and trying to invest in that. Next one, antiquated acquisition process. I'm gonna do a pop quiz. For, for everybody here, um, and you can, you, if you close your eyes so you don't indict yourself if you're worried about this, but um, I think everyone can agree that we need, we have some very fundamental needs to change a lot of what we do in the Navy, to change our force, uh, to, to go into a, a new era of great power competition. And I just wanna see a show of hands of people who, who are, have questions about whether or not our acquisition process is agile and adaptable enough to do that? Who has doubts about that? Okay, awesome. <laughs> okay, so it worries me too, and it's on my mind a lot. Uh, legacy business operations, uh, looking across our businesses and under, trying to understand how best to modernize our business practices as well as our business systems is a big part of my portfolio as the chief management officer of the department. 
$13 billion carriers. This has been a big topic this year, especially as we were looking at uh, to try and figure out a way to drive that cost down. Uh, I think when I was first came in the Navy in 1979, I think a carrier was between two and three billion dollars. Uh, $13 billion is a lot of money, and uh, we are not resource unconstrained uh, in our budget. So that's a big, big issue for us. Uh, AI, artificial intelligence, how are we going to integrate that? How are our adversaries going to integrate that? How are we going to make that part of our warfighting mission? Uh, also, from my CMO hat, thinking about business systems, AI always means to me always or almost implemented, uh, which is a Unfortunately, it seems to be some of the standards we have in some of our business systems that don't really quite work like we wanted them to in the end. Russian revanchism, obviously geopolitical context has gotten a lot more complicated. We have a, uh, a leader in the, Soviet, in the uh, former Soviet Union, Russia and Federation now, who is being very aggressive and testing us in ways that we've not been tested before, sort of on the edges, on the periphery, using all types of asymmetric types of approaches to make us feel uncomfortable and make our allies feel uncomfortable. Chinese mercantilism. This is one of our biggest challenges as we look across the globe and we see how the Chinese are, are, are emphasizing their economic prosperity and growth, the One Belt, One Road initiative, and what they're doing to expand their influence around the world is quite striking and stunning and something that we should be very concerned about because it manifests itself in lots of different ways, not just in what they're doing, but how it influences our, our relationships with our, other partners and allies around the world. I spent a, went on a trip this summer, I was just mentioning this to my, to my table, uh, I went on a trip this summer to the Pacific Islands. I started in Hawaii, I went from there to Kiribati, and then to Papua New Guinea, and Vanuatu, and Fiji, and Micronesia, and Guam. And in every one of these locations, the Chinese are there, and they are very aggressive. And for some, in my sense is, in talking to government leaders there, they would rather have us, quite frankly. But a lot of these countries are very poor, and the checkbook that the Chinese show up with is uh, very, very enticing to them. So why they'd rather not have to, uh, to deal with them, they do have massive infrastructure needs in a lot of these countries, and the Chinese are there and they're investing. We're doing the best we can. I would say that I don't think we have a great sort of uh, cross-government, whole-of-government strategy for how to deal with China, and in this particular area, um, an example that I like to use a lot is when I was in Micronesia, we have a team of CBs, 24 CBs there on the far side of the, uh, one of the islands building a schoolhouse. And they're building it out of plywood and concrete footings and corrugated steel roof. And it's great, great, great kids out there doing the work. Great connections they're making with the local community. Right next door, massive sign. Micronesian Agricultural Center being paid for and built by the Chinese government. So I kind of got this sense that we're playing small ball in a lot of these areas. And we need to think about that a lot more strategically and how we might want to challenge that. Escalating health care costs, when we look across our budget, these are, these are factors that are really driving a lot of changes for us in the department. The, the Congress looked at this. They've asked us to reorganize how we deliver military medicine, uh, both to our uh, dependents but also to the active duty military. They've imposed a, a structure on us called the Defense Health Agency. Uh, it's being, it's being implemented right now, but I will tell you it is not going smoothly. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how this is going to work, uh, who's ultimately responsible for readiness, and a lot of debates uh, going on around, uh, about that. And that's been heavily on our minds uh, in the department. In addition to the fact that we look at our budget and our people cost, it's really squeezing our budget. Educating for uncertainty. Uh, this has been one of something that I've been thinking about a lot since I got into the position. Are we really do we really have an overall strategy for how we're going to educate our sailors and Marines, both from the enlisted all the way through the officer corps? Are we looking at this properly? And uh, we've done a lot of work on that and studies on that, and I'll talk more about some of the outcomes of that in a minute. Strain on our forces. As I mentioned before, the operational requirements have not come down. Uh, we are still engaged in the global war on terror. And it's amazing to me when I get briefed, uh, I get my intel briefs every morning, about how many places in the world we have deployed forces. It's really quite stunning uh, to understand that. And that takes its toll. Uh, it puts a lot of strain on our people and on their families. And that's obviously the next point. The impact of that, the impact that that has on our families, uh, we have to be very cognizant of that and, and think through how we're creating healthy environments for our, our families. Cyber espionage, again, we are 
in the midst of a conflict right now with major competitors around the world. Some are state sponsors and some are not. Uh, but they're coming at us through our networks, through our vulnerabilities, and they're stealing from us. And they're stealing intellectual capital and they're bankrupting companies and they're doing this without any type of response that is stopping them right now. And this is critical, not just in terms of how we operate, but when you think about it, you think about the very edge, some of the vulnerabilities we may have in, in, in actual warfare at the, at the edge, where uh, at the pointy end of the spear, we worry about it there. But there's also the concern about, hey, our vulnerabilities may be so great that we may not, be, may not even be able to get our ships underway out of San Diego um, if they hit us in a certain way. So we have to take this very seriously. And then, of course, great power competitions on the seas. This is really something that we've not had to think about that seriously at all in the last 20 years, but now we do um, because we are facing something that we haven't really faced in a long time. And I'll just walk you through some, uh, some slides that demonstrate this. This is 1999, and you can see our four deplo de deployed naval forces in 1999 was one carrier, nine crews, no, sort of large surface combatants, uh, 67 fighter aircraft, and uh, uh, maritime uh, surveillance of about 12 aircraft, no SSNs. And you can see where the PRC was at that time. So let's fast forward about 10 years, and you can see the changes already. We're about the same. They've increased substantially in that 10-year phase. And you can also see the areas that are shaded on the ocean there, the South China Sea up to the second, uh, second island chain. These are areas that they're normally operating that they were not even operating in 10 years prior to that. This is 2009. Here's today, or 2017. And you can see how much more force and how much more capability they have and where they're operating. Here's our sort of sad situation. <laughs> and. I, not everything's bad, so I'm hoping you don't, don't think that, but these are just things that are on my mind because uh, these are the things that we have to address. Used to do a, when I used to teach at the Air Force Academy, I used to do a matching thing on their, on their quizzes just to give them some easy points, I thought. Um, <laughs> it didn't always work out that way. But here's some matching of some statistics on the left side and then what they match to on the right side. So the left side, 7.1 million, one, number one, number six, 90 percent. Uh, Ammonium perchlorate, so many people must know that one here. Uh, minus 17,000, one equals 70 percent, two percent to minus three percent, eight years, 70 percent. So let's see what this means. That's the number of lost manufacturing jobs in the United States since 1979 when I came into the Navy, 7.1 million. That's the number of companies in the United States that manufacture thin wall castings. Uh, and that's, those are the castings that are used on all rotary wing aircraft in the United States military for all the gearboxes. There's only one company that does that in the United States and it's in bankruptcy right now. That's the number of companies in the United States that do manufacturing and repair of ship and, sub, uh, and submarine propeller shafts, one. Anyone work for that company? <laughs> it's yours, probably. Um, that's the number of large caliber gun barrel companies that are, uh, remain existing in the United States, manufacturing companies, one. Number one, number six, the Chinese are the number one importers of and users of machine tools. The United States is number six. And that's, that's a forward-looking, that's a leading indicator of what they're going to be doing. These are capital investments and machine tools that will be used for manufacturing, and that's sort of the, the gap that we have between uh, the two of us. 90% of the printed circuit boards in the world are manufactured in Asia. Half of those are manufactured in China. Ammonium perchlorate, DOD, it's a DOD propellant that's critical to all of our rocket fuel, everything we use on all those weapons. One manufacturer in the United States that still makes that. There are 17,000 fewer DOD vendors right now primary vendors, prime contractors, than there were in, in the year 2000 in the United States. There's one company in the world that manufactures all of the commercial UASs, and that's in China. That's a change in U.S. productivity 
we had been experiencing 2% growth in, in, in uh, productivity up until about the year 2003. Since 2003, negative 0.3%. It takes us eight years from the time we conceive a program and get it actually uh, to, to IOC. And that amount of time, 70% of the electronics that have been designed into that program are obsolete. So there's a great radio program that I like to listen to. It's called The John Bachelor Show. Anyone ever listen to that? It's really, really good. Uh, does a, and he likes to talk about the Navy. So if you ever have a chance, he's got a podcast. He's very good. And, he, and what he does at the beginning of his shows is he'll throw out a bunch of words like this that'll get you alarmed. And then he'll ask this question, which is what is, what is to be done? And from my perspective, uh, what is to be done is that we have to radically change how we think about and how we execute uh, within the naval, naval forces how we train our people, what we expect from our people, what we expect from our manufacturing base, our acquisition processes. And they, what I think it should be just defined by some cert, are certain characteristics that I think we should be looking for. One of them is trust. We need to build much better trust between our people, between the manufacturing base, between, um, between uh, allies uh, as well, so that we must recognize that this problem cannot be solved alone. We need to increase our speed in how we do things. We need to collaborate better. We need to have much greater visibility and transparency of information and data to the right source at the right time. We have to become much more adaptable. We have to be able to innovate. We have to be humble and recognize the deficiencies that we have. And the last one I like to throw in there is this term skepticism. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I mean question and challenge assumptions. So, when you think about these terms and you pull them all together, to me, it really, it really draws to one single word, and that's the word agility. So how do we know when we're agile? How do we know when we become agile, or people are agile, or organizations are agile? I, I think when we start seeing these types of characteristics out there, we'll know that we've reached it. The second piece of the puzzle is we have to have greater commitment, clarity, better measures, better monitoring, better consequences to increase our accountability as an organization. So just want to walk through a couple things that we're doing to try and advance this, these concepts of agility and accountability in our people and our processes. This is something we're doing around people. And that is to basically take our existing and sort of arcane processes for managing people, managing their information, and putting it in the hands of devices that they're used to, that they've grown up with. You know, our gener the generation of kids that are coming into the service right now have grown up with uh, in the digital age. And so what we're trying to do is transform how we give them information, how they become part of, uh, of the Navy using those same tools that they're used to. So this is one device where they, were, uh, this is part of uh, how they can manage their, their uh, change of station, basically do it all, line, all online, go through the uh, process to do that. We also have a similar way to sort of manage their entire, uh, their entire uh, personnel record. They can do that online now. There's also a detailing marketplace, which you can go in and put in your preferences for where you'd like to go. You can manage your career more actively on your own. And then also, same thing with your performance evaluation system, putting this all online, giving our sailors, uh, sailors the tools that they need. What we're doing around sort of property and equipment, the two carrier buy, uh, a lot of people in this room were involved in this, I'm sure. Uh, but basically, what we were able to do is recognize how long the lead, lead times are for equipment like this. These ships take a really long time to get out. We're able to, this, this took discussion all the way up to the president's level to get agreement around this. But because of this, because of the ability to think differently about how we would acquire things, we were able to save $4 billion as compared to what we would have done uh, doing two separate buys. And also, because of this process, there's several other modifications that are going to the, to the, um, to the two CVN buy, but we'll save another $200 million by getting that equipment on there now rather than having to retrofit them later on. So quickly go through this. This is an example of managing property better. This is downtown San Diego, uh, the Broadway complex here, where we're, we're in, a, in an agreement, private-public uh, partnership, uh, to turn over some facilities here and, and do land swaps. And we're doing this in a lot of different places, looking at opportunities to turn over some of our property to private sector development uh, where, it makes, where it makes sense. 
We're looking at some of the opportunities to do this in Washington, D.C. as well right now. What we've also tried to do, and one of the things that's been one of the critical areas that has been my responsibility, is to define and understand what it is we're doing around the business mission area of the department. I'm the chief management officer of the Navy um, by law, and uh, one of the things that I'm required to do is have some type of a plan that pulls together what we're doing across the department, understand where there might be conflicts, and develop an integrated story and a plan. So we published the business operations plan back in October. Uh, we are now managing to this on a quarterly basis. There are milestones. And the thing is built around the concepts of agility and accountability and tied directly to the national defense strategy. So when you look at it, there's three lines of, uh, of effort in the national defense strategy. The first one is to uh, restore readiness. The next, second one is to uh, uh, rebuild and uh, emphasize our, our, our partnerships and alliances. And the third one is to reform the business operations in order to reinvest in modernization. So we've tied everything. I went back to the, I went to the department and said, look, if you can't tie what you're doing to these three things, these elements of, of the, the lines of effort of the national defense strategy, we might want to think about why we're doing it at all. And it took a long time to go through that. It took several months, probably six months. But from that, those three lines of, uh, of effort, we identified nine key objectives for the business mission area. From there, 14 uh, outcomes. So it's sort of like that same question about agility. There's a great, there's a great uh, quote from Justice Brennan. When he was looking at a case on pornography, some of you might have heard this, and he was trying to define what por pornography is. They wanted to look for a de definition of pornography, and he said, I can't really say what pornography is, and I'm not sure, really sure it's that important to define it, but I just know it when I see it. It's the same thing with agility. We'll know it when we see it, but when we start identifying, we start seeing some of those characteristics that I mentioned, then I think we'll know it when we see it. The same thing with these outcomes. There are 14 key outcomes we would like to know. We would like to see those things as so that, not that just we're just ticking off things off a checklist, but how does that translate to how the forces are actually operating and what we're doing as, a, as an enterprise. From there, 49 major Don objectives that we're managing to, and 212 supporting initiatives that are tied to each one of those. And so the secretary looks at this on a quarterly basis. I look at it on a monthly basis, so the teams are managing to this. And that's been a big breakthrough for the department. One of the areas in the bottom, bottom section of that plan, section 3.3 in those objectives, is to look at the financial audit. One of the first questions I got when I had my uh, confirmation hearing was from Senator McCain, and he asked me about the Navy. He, he, he ranted for a really long time about something, and I wasn't quite sure what that was about. And then he asked me, when is the Navy going to get an audit? And I told him that, you know, that I knew that the Navy was on track to get a full audit. It's the first time we did it. We worked with uh, our auditor partner, which was uh, ENY. It's the first time we've ever gone through a full and complete audit. And we found, after looking at that, multiple numbers of, uh, of recommendations and findings that we needed to act on. What I, my commitment to the Congress was, we're not just going to start ticking off these, these, uh, these recommendations. We're going to strategize around which ones are the most important, which ones impact lethality first. So we have issues around our accounting systems. We have nine current general ledger systems, and they're not connected, and they create all kinds of disparities in our ability to truly understand our financial information. We have business systems that are even more complicated than that, that require interfaces that cause breaks in data, secu data security, data integrity. Our financial reporting, because of all those problems and the other two, we don't have good financial reporting. We're doing a lot of estimating, a lot of hand jamming of information that most modern industrial corporations never have to do. Most modern industrial corporations can push a button and generate a financial report. We are not even close to that, and we have to get better on that. Our fund balance with Treasury, another key area, understanding where we stand with respect to Congress, what's been paid, I mean, with, Congress, with respect to the Treasury, what's been paid, what's not been paid. Uh, we don't have good fidelity around that. Uh, our inventory, a great example of inventory. When we went out and actually started counting inventory and understanding where our stuff was, we had an example here in San Diego where they found a warehouse here that no one knew existed. It had $26 million worth of parts for the E2 and the F-18, and I think even some F-14 parts in that, in that warehouse. It was not categorized. It didn't sit on any inventory system that we had in the whole Department of the Navy. Once that was identified, we were able to requisition $19 million worth of parts to aircraft that were waiting for them and were down because we didn't even know we had those parts. This is a serious problem for us that we really have to get after. 
uh, because at the end of the day, it impacts our ability to, to perform the mission and our costs. Budgetary reform, that's sort of how we're organized in the department, how money can change hands, how money can move around. We have to tighten up a lot of that. Real property, this year we're gonna have 100% inventory of our real property. It's never been done before in the Navy. Uh, we had buildings we didn't know where they were. We had buildings that didn't have numbers on them. We had a property that existed that was not on any type of books or anything like that. So we're going through that this year. And then of course, IT general controls. Who controls our systems? Who allows modifications to be made to those systems? Right now it's very loose and we have to tighten that up. So all this stuff sounds very technical and audity and boring, but it, at the end of the day it impacts lethality. The goal here is to increase lethality. This, the example I give you about the inventory that was missing, that has an immediate impact on lethality. And if we had known about that, if that had been in our systems properly and categorized properly, we would have aircraft that would have been flying that weren't down or didn't have to have parts robbed off of other aircraft that needed to be operating and flying. So the impact here is, to, is of all these types of things is to get a better visibility about our enterprise so we can A, save money, but also impact the lethality of the force. So what is next? A Couple of t things I wanna talk about today because they're very timely. Um, this, this week uh, we, we, we published something called the Education for Sea Power Study. When I came into the department and had my first conversation with the secretary, he asked me what was something important that I wanted to focus on during my tenure, not knowing how long or how short it was gonna be, and I said that I really was concerned about naval education and I wanted to understand whether or not we were doing things right in education because at the end of the day, the minds of our sailors and Marines are gonna be our competitive advantage. We can protect our technology only so far. We can protect our intellectual capital only so far. It's the ability to create people who are agile and adaptable and can think through strategic situations is what, that's what's gonna differentiate us from our competitors. And so we need to invest in that. So I, I commissioned a study last year. We had uh, uh, five very prominent people on the panel. It was uh, General John Allen from the Marine Corps, uh, retired, he's now the president of Brookings. Vice, or Admiral Mullen, who you all know, is the former chairman of the JCS, uh, Vice Admiral Ann Rondeau, who used to be the president of National Defense University and is now the president of the Postgraduate School. Dr. Harlan Ullman, who is a, uh, a writer and a thinker, a national security expert, also on the faculty at the War College. And then uh, Ambassador Barbara Barrett, who sort of worked private education as well as uh, military education. And they embarked on about a six to seven month deep dive study. It's, it has not been done in the Navy since uh, 1918. A hundred years ago, uh, a captain by the name of Ernie King, who you've probably all heard of, uh, and two other captains, Captain Knox and Captain Pye, published a, a, a deep dive, sort of clean sheet review of naval education. Their findings had a profound impact on the training and education of our naval leaders in World War II. That study came out 100 years ago. We haven't looked at it that seriously since then. We just published the report yesterday, uh, but we've been looking at it for a couple of months, and the Secretary has been mulling around several recommendations, and uh, we are gonna be implementing those uh, uh, post-haste. Second one is uh, information management. Part of the education for Sea Power Study, one of the things that we've decided to do is to create a new naval university system, and starting also with a naval community college to give the, our sailors and Marines the opportunity to gain a, a, a associate degrees uh, while they're serving, and also to unify all the various academic institutions that we have across the, the naval enterprise. The secretary is also going to appoint somebody to be his chief learning officer for naval education. That person will have responsibility for looking at the budgets uh, and ensuring that we're, we're not robbing from our educational uh, programs uh, over, the course, over the course of time, which is what has been ended up happening because they're buried within various other uh, agencies within the, within the Navy. Uh, the second piece that we're elevating is information management, and I talked to the CIO council, this, the CIO folks this morning, the IT folks about this. We're in discussions right now with the Congress to create a new Assistant Secretary of the Navy for information management. Um, we just really feel that we need to elevate the leadership and management of that to the Secretariat level, uh, be able to also use the power of that office to recruit somebody really, really credible, uh, possibly from private sector, but not necessarily, uh, to really help us organize and elevate uh, information management as a, as a key area. And then the last piece, uh, 
there's a professor by the name of Paul Bracken from Yale University. And at the end of the Cold War, he talked about uh, how we need to start thinking about the military after next, not the one we're looking at 10 year, within the next 10-year window, but 10 years beyond that. What does that military after next look like? So the Secretary and I uh, have been talking about what do we think about what the naval forces after next should look like. I personally believe we're at an inflection point in that regard. If you look at the evolution of naval force, you know, you started out, particularly in the U.S. Navy, started out with uh, ships under sail, coming in close to each other, comp, you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then, all of a sudden, you have st steam that you don't, you're not reliant on the elements as much. Then, uh, armored ships that basically were eclipsed then by air, 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 uh, air power in World War II. Everything since, air, since World War II has sort of been forced 4.1, 4.2, 4.3. I think we're at a point now where there's a new inflection point where we're talking about network forces that are going to be very, very different than what we've experienced in our collective lives. So before I finish, I just want to talk about uh, Senior Chief Shannon Kent. That's Shannon Kent. Uh, last week, I had the opportunity to listen to stories about Shannon Kent from the chief's mess um, to which she was assigned at Fort Meade. And when I heard these stories about Shannon and all the qualities that she embraced, adaptable, hard-charging, innovative, compassionate, it's all those things that we think about when I think about agility. Well, we lost Shannon four weeks ago in Syria. And so when we start thinking about what our jobs are and what your jobs are, we're all part of a broad naval ecosystem here, a broad naval network. The people at the end of that network, the node at the end of that network, are people like her. And so we need to be very serious and thoughtful about what we're doing every single day to make sure when we put our people out uh, that they're the best equipped, they have the best possible protection, and that they're doing a mission that really matters. So think about Shannon. If someone asks you today, what's the one thing you learned today? Think about her. Thanks very much. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll be asking uh, just one icebreaker question, and then uh, people can collect their thoughts and come up to the microphone. We ask that you identify yourself, and please ask a question. And uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for those remarks. I was going to ask you, of all the things that you, you, you talked about, you were preparing yourself for the job, you were kind of circulating, getting ideas, and ramping up for your confirmation, and then taking this position. What is the thing that now that you've been on station that has surprised you the most, good or bad, that, uh, that you didn't expect to encounter when you went through that process and are now into the job? Wow, that's a good question. Um, well, let me say what I, I've, I think there is something that I did expect that I've been even more overwhelmed with than I thought originally, and that is um, what an honor and a privilege, privilege it is to actually have the opportunity to serve in a job like this. Um, you just, you meet the most incredible people. Um, they treat you with an incredible amount of respect and, uh, and dignity, and to me, there's nothing greater than that. So to me, that's been a really great surprise. I think the other thing I think that surprised me a little bit is, uh, it's a little bit of disappointment having been in the department 12 and 15 years ago and working on a lot of the business transformation stuff that we did there, and we thought we had sort of set up a good path for the department. Uh, a lot of those things that we try to get in place did not get put in place. Um, so that's a little bit frustrating and disappointing. And I think it's sort of gone through cycles where it's, it's what we all, we've always said about this, this particular area, the business mission really needs senior level engagement. And we've had so many other issues that the depart senior leadership in the department has had to deal with to include massive turnover. I think the, uh, President Obama had three or four secretaries of defense. Um, they sort of waffled around about whether or not they wanted to have a chief management officer, and, and so I think that's not been very successful. So for, for me, that's been a, a disappointing surprise that not more progress has been made. 
But at the same time, I, I, I don't see any waning in enthusiasm among the people that I, in the department to try and get these things done. So it's, that's a good part of it. Well, thank you. Uh, the mic is open. I'm going to ask one more question while people are thinking of if they've got another question. And that you just uh, alluded to the education for sea power study. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that leapt out for me, and maybe it's because I'm like a liberal arts major from College of the Holy Cross instead of a, you know, aeronautical engineering major from the Naval Academy. But, um, you know, we're always trying to strike that balance between the necessary technological skills and the training. And in some of our programs, we stipulate an 85% technical major requirement, like for NROTC, mm -hmm. and it's similar for the Naval Academy, not quite exactly the same. Um, and yet, it seems like just a few years into your time in service, the ability to read, think, speak, write, and articulate and compel become overpowering. They become the thing you need the most. In your study, did you talk about that and the right balance for that? They, they absolutely, so to, to be clear, it's, we had a, it was an independent study. I was the chairman of the study, but the thoughts and the conclusions were all of the panel themselves. And they absolutely did look at that. Uh, that the need for, for developing strategic thinkers uh, was a critical element, particularly for our leadership, that we need to make sure we're investing in at the proper times. But there's also that balance. You know, strategic thinking in today's context means you sort of have to have an understanding of what uh, cyber is, right? So there's sure. a technical element to it now that, uh, so I don't think there's any easy answer here to this. So I, I'm sort of averse to saying, well, you gotta have 40% this, and. 20% that, uh, that doesn't make sense. I think we have to look at the entire progression and when do you place, uh, when, when do you, when's the most appropriate time to place different levels of education so that we produce officers that when they're in the position where they really need all those skills to come together, they've had that, they've had that education. So. No, that's great. We've got a, a taker here. Good afternoon, sir. My name is uh, Rear Admiral Retired Mike Mann, and I'm a surface warfare officer, and I'm about to take some heat from carrier aviators, but <laughs> um, with a $13 billion price tag for an aircraft carrier and the vision of building the Navy after next, what was the compelling argument that convinced the leadership to spend or to sign the contract to build the next two supercarriers? Well, I think that generally there was a decision that those two, there was a general conclusion that those two for sure were gonna get built. Uh, with the secretary, so once that was sort of determined that that was gonna happen, um, I think a lot of derivative decisions still need to be made. So the secretary would like to take a look at, okay, now that we've made that decision and, and that second one that comes is gonna be quite a few years from now, we need to start thinking now about what's the next one look like. Um, but. So that's sort of what drove the decision. So once a decision was made that yes, we, we're pretty certain that we're gonna need to at least buy these two, it made no sense to say, all right, let's buy one now and then do the contract for the other one two or three years from now when the price is gonna be significantly more. So we were able to lock in at a, at a price that frees up basically $4 billion for us to think about uh, other, other things to fill in the inventory of the fleet. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Everett Hayes. I'm with Sus Consulting. I'm also a surface warfare officer. Sir, I, I understand and, and I appreciate your, uh, your bringing this holistic picture of how we're going to move forward. And we, we focus a lot on kinetic uh, response. But the thing that seems to be moving faster than anything is information warfare. And I wanted to know if you could elaborate on how you think we might tackle this moving target that seems to be moving faster than we can acquire and faster than we can learn? So I don't have an answer to that. Um, what I do have an answer to is I don't think that we were well organized to answer that question. And so this is one of the reasons why we've, we're looking at this concept of uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Information Management so that we can look at this more holistically across the department and understand and get the right people at the table to start thinking about those, those questions. I don't have the answer to that question. The conclusion I came to was 
we're not we, we're not organized to to actually address it properly, and that's what we're trying to do. So in a year from now, I'll probably be able to address that a little bit better than I can today. But thanks for the question. It's a great question. It's the biggest challenge we have, quite frankly. Um, and uh, this is what I this is what I'm talking about when I say I think we're at an inflection point for the naval service. Uh, we got to get organized. We got to get some high-powered uh, brains thinking about it. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mr. Secretary, thanks for being here today and for your great remarks. Uh, I'm Kurt Hamill, and I'm the uh, Surface Warfare Officer hat trick, so three in a row. Uh, but, sir, the, uh, you're, you're speaking to an audience that, that understands the need for a robust naval force. But there's 300 million American citizens that need to understand that this investment is needed. Uh, how are we getting that message out to the, to the people of America so that they don't, you know, say, hey, look, there's so many aircraft carriers, you add up all the navies in the world, they don't have that many aircraft carriers, why do we need more aircraft carriers? I mean, there is, there is a groundswell of disbelief at the cost of, of, of global sea power. Mm -hmm. How are you communicating that? Well, we're trying to do a much better job at that, and um, it is one area that I'm not satisfied that we're doing a good job, so I appreciate you raising the question. We're working on developing that naval narrative. Why do we need a naval force? What, how, how does it operate? How should it operate? What does it do for us with respect to uh, just maintaining our basic security? But uh, if you take a look at the, you look at the, the amount of, of goods that travel across the seas and the need, the need to secure all that, I think that connection uh, to the average citizen has not been made very well. But it can be, because it's a pretty compelling story. I just don't think we've done a great job at it, and we need, to, we need people like you. you, you know, I know you all are, are, are in this ecosystem, but you deal with people who aren't in the ecosystem, too. Uh, and so it's really important that you get that message out to the people that you come in contact with who don't really understand a lot about the Navy or the Marine Corps or the Naval Service or the threats we're facing. You have to make that connection. And I, it's, it goes even deeper than that. I mean, one of the things that I've been concerned about is um, when I, was in, uh, when I was in Cleveland for, for Navy Week, uh, we were driving through the city, and I had a motorcade, which is a really cool thing if you've never had a motorcade, but um, two, two police motorcycles in front, and we were crossing a bridge, and a guy gets out of his car as we were about to cross a bridge, and he gets out of his car, and he has a Vietnam veteran's hat on, and he stops and he salutes us as we go by. He had no idea who we were. And so we st I said, hey, stop the motorcade. Let's, let's go talk to this guy. So I'm talking to him. Vietnam veteran, uh, was in the Army, uh, returned to the United States in, um, returned to the United States in 1970, I think, and he was explaining to me how he was so honored because he was able to bring his best friend's body back with him. And he, I said, well, what was it like when you got home? He said, well, when I got to the airport, people, there were protesters, and they spit on me, and they swore at me, and they threw garbage on me. and." Uh, he said, you know, and I listened, I listened to him tell the story, but he, then he just quickly pivoted to, you know, how proud he was of his service and everything. So my concern is that the point that you make about the general population not understanding um, what the Naval Service does is a concern, but I'm also really concerned that we're getting, that we're getting disconnected from the people that serve. Because we, we become kind of very insular. Uh, you look at things, you, there's some statistics I've seen about um, people that are enlisting now or people that are joining the Naval Academy. They're coming from families that served in the military. So we've become very sort of insular type of organization. So we need to be able to reach out and make sure that uh, the people in the general population understand the sacrifices that are made. Um, I went to, to uh, Shannon's funeral last week at the Naval Academy and there was like 4,000 people there. They were all people that had a connection to the military. Um, and to me, that was it, was, it was a little bit sad that there's this person that lives in their community. She's a, she's a mother, you know, two children, doing this incredibly dangerous job with incredible skills, not getting paid anything near what she'd be making in the private sector. And we have to do, just do a better job of connecting people to that. So thanks for the question. Thanks, this will be the last question. Mr. Secretary, thanks for coming out. Uh, I'm Mike Fallon, General Dynamics. I'm your duty Marine, so for all the Marines, thanks for being out here. Uh, readiness was a big issue two years ago. We were in a hole. Um, the administration took it on. Can you comment on the next three budget cycles on where we are today in readiness and where we're going? 
Yeah, I think that we've, I think we're digging ourselves out of that readiness hole, but it's going to take a long time. It's not something that can be corrected uh, in one or two budget cycles. Um, the president, at every indication, and I'm not going to get ahead of him or OMB, uh, is continuing to be committed to, to maintaining our budget levels. Now, he had made some statements earlier this year about, or last year, about taking a 10% cut on all the federal agencies in their budgets, but he did not do that to defense. So my sense is he continued to, to, to drive in that direction. I think we feel, I know the secretary feels that we've, on, we're on a good path to restore readiness, and that's why he wants to start thinking more about strategy in the long term in terms of where we're going and where we're headed as, as a naval service. So um, I don't see, I don't, I don't personally see it subsiding. I think we're on a decent path here, at least for the next couple of years. But as you know, you know, we have elections every four years here, and no one knows what's going to happen. So thank you. Secretary Modley, we thank you for your remarks today. We have a Naval Institute Press book, The Free Sea. Great. The American Fight for Freedom of Navigation, uh, back at your table by James Kraska and Raul Pedrozo, and it also has an FCA bookmark, but that's just a token. Um, it obviously means a great deal to us for you to give your precious time to our audience today, and let's give the Secretary a big hand. Thanks, Pete. Thanks very much. Thank you.